this time I'd like to present to you Reverend Dr. Frick, the care of the Holy Ghost.
Uh, look at the neighbor and ask the neighbor, say, neighbor, do you have some strategies for success? <laughs> do you have some strategies for success? Um, um, you know, basically there are three types of people that we find in the world. And one, people who make things happen. The people who watch things happen. And the people who do not know what in the world has happened. <laughs> Now, the vision of excellence is of such where God would show us things to maximize our God-given potential. And the things that are laid down in God's word are there as a measuring stick so that we can be challenged. We can understand how in principle God has given us all that we need to make it to a higher plane in Him. One of the things that strikes me about this particular verse of scripture is that it says when, when Joshua observes to do these things that he would have good success. Good success. Now, we know that success might be relative, depending on what one's ambitions and goals are, whatever their aspirations are. But many will aspire, but only few will attain. Everybody has a dream, but very few will have the dynamics and the mechanism to make this dream a reality. And so they pipe dream. People just, they, 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 they want to do things, but they have not the impetus and the desire, the drive, or the initiative, or taking the God-given opportunity to arrive where they are different to be. God said to Joshua, if you will apply a few principles and remember the word and utilize that word as an experiential tool, you will be guaranteed good success. One of the questions I asked God, I said, well, if he is guaranteed good success, then, then what's bad success? Because if there's good success, there would have to be bad success. And then I, I was reminded that the people who extort for a living, such as the mafia, and they may make money, but, but it's bad success. The people who stand on the corners and those who, who, who peddle drugs and those who are, who are pushing these drugs, and, then, and, and they, they begin to ask, extort lives and harass, this is bad success. Not because he drives the brand new BMW, and because he drives a brand new Lexus, and because he drives a brand new Mercedes Benz, and might I say even a Jaguar, uh, amen. It doesn't mean that it's good success. Because you live in a fancy home and because you dress nicely and because you wear a beautiful silk tie doesn't mean that that is good success. But the challenge of good success goes beyond that of any physical thing that you can attain. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. So even though you may afford to yourself a lot of financial, a lot of material, amen, and a lot of tangible things, it does not say that you are successful. Not everybody that laughs are happy. Not everybody that cries is sad. And so you can surround yourself with creature comforts and yet be the most miserable person in the world. How do you listen, Bob? As well as you might not have anything according to man's measuring sticks. And yet at the same time, inside you are at peace with the God of yourself. And so success has to be measured as God looks at it. Success then, as we look at it, is like life then reaching to our climbing to a mountain top. It's, it's a climber's work to go towards your goal or reaching out to that mountain top experience, reaching your highest pinnacle of potential. And the experience is at one of excruciating pain. Any mountain climber who endeavors to reach the epitaph or the peak of your goal must be willing to endure the difficulties and the hardships of that climb. Amen, somebody. And so we find that they'll, they'll be grabbing at rocks and then, and then hunting for small holes to put a foot to our toe in. And, and so, you know, in life, you look for the opportunities that God gives you to pull yourself up to a higher level in Him. You look for the little holes of life where things through disappointments oftentimes, because sometimes a disappointment is only a reappointment. It makes so much. It's never over until it's over. It's never over until God says so. If, if John Mark was to follow everything that Paul had said, he would never go back on the mission field. Paul was harsh. And Paul said, to Paul said, listen, I'm telling you, Barnabas, that nephew of yours, he's a coward, he's a little sissy. Let him go home. Back in Acts chapter 12. Stay in the house of, of, of his mother Mary. We're rolling it. Go stay in that open house in Jerusalem. He loves a warm cooked meal. He can't take the jungle experience of mosquitoes and snakes when I have a tough neck. And we don't want these little handsy pansies with us. Can you imagine if he used somebody else's opinion to determine who he was? Hmm? When Paul said, I don't, the Bible said, they were so vehement, Barnabas and 
Paul, they always went to his family. Men of God, apostles. Because one was a son of consolation. One who thought that it was good in everyone. Because Paul himself, when he sought credibility, he had none because he was known as Saul. And it was Barnabas who consoled the church, who said, listen, you've got to be willing to give others what you've got. If you want forgiveness, show forgiveness. If you want love, give love. Come on, talk to me. What you sow, you reap. When Paul was in jail, and Alexander the Coppersmith had done him much evil, and, and everybody at the party, save Luke, was writing for him, he said, he said, now, many years later, see, when you're in adverse circumstances, then, you know, cow never misses his tail until he needs it. Never really knows the duty of his tail until the tail is gone. And when the flies of life are biting you, you take for granted the fact that you have people around you who can support you. But when you have no tail, Lord have mercy. Huh? And mosquitoes start hitting you and flies start hitting you. And when Paul was alone, he says, every man has forsaken me. Demas did me wrong. Alexander the couple speak. May God repay him. Because now he was somewhat bitter, but he was broken. And here in his lonely state, he says, send John Mark, for he's profitable for the ministry. I imagine nothing changed about John Mark, but something changed in Paul. And success then can't be measured. No one can determine your worth based upon your action. God looks beyond your failures, and God sees your potential success. It's not what you're going through right now, it's what, what God has in store in it for you. Hallelujah, somebody. As climbers, then you're working towards your goal. And we're hunting small two holes, two holes in order to pull ourselves up to a higher ground. And it's a strain, it's a strenuous situation to pull oneself up in a higher place. It, it takes effort to, to rise above the, the status quo. It takes effort to rise above the, the, the average. It takes effort to get above the stereotype of black folks and Caribbean folks. And, uh, it takes effort to get beyond that of the breaking. To get past that line, glory be to God, you have to be willing in your heart to go about. Now, there's something that is very significant about what made Joshua a potential candidate for leadership. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to begin to look in retrospect of why God would rehearse these things in his ears. All that God had said to Moses, God rehearses in the ears of Joshua. But you're not going to get, you're not going to do it overnight one it's not going to happen. Everything that you're going through now is the very means and the stepping stone that will take you to where God will bring you ultimately. Even your failures and your defeat. Hallelujah, God. It's about maintaining an excellent spirit. No matter how much your brothers send you out and put you in a home and Ishmael's value, if they say, even if they forgot you, the baker and the butler forget about you, but you don't forget about your God. What if his wife lies on you? But all these things are the things that are working character. Nobody say character. See, everybody, you can have gift. Gift will put you up in the ceiling, but, but only character can keep you there. <laughs> only character and what we're going through in the fires of afflictions and trials are there intended to form character. God said, I have chosen you in the furnace of your affliction. It's in the fire. In essence, the principle is, when the fourth man was in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they came out, the hair was a singe, and they never smelled like smoke. We don't get bitter, we get better. I was burnt. So what? They've all been burnt. The bottom line is, why are you going to walk around without forgiveness? While the person who hurts you is moving on successfully to the Lord, long forgotten it, and just moving right along, you're walking around, oh, bitter, bitter, and shit. I'll never love again. Denying yourself of life, peace, and success. Look at it as a neighbor. Forget about it. And move right along. Let's move on. When Paul spoke to the church of Philippi, he said in Philippians 3.14, he says, this one thing I do. It's ironic. But well, he was doing one thing that had several parts. This one thing I do. Here's how. The one thing had components. One thing. I forgot those things which were behind. One thing though. I reached those things that were in front. I press. That's a three in one. Because one thing he was doing. But in order for you to get forward, in order for you to succeed, 
You have to have a mindset to forget those things which are behind. Nobody drives forward looking in the rear view mirror. Reach into those things which are before. I stretch my body. I'm back. If you want 
not good. You've got to pay the dues. You've got to pay your price. Hallelujah, God. And so here's what it is. Moses says to Joshua, Josh, stay here. I soon come. Now those of you that came from the Caribbean, you know when a Caribbean person says soon come, this thing could last for a very, very long time. <laughs> Moses says to Joshua, soon come. Going up to hear from God. Stay here, soon come. Now, for days, we know in duration, 40 days Moses stayed up in the mount. But for the 40 days, Joshua was so obedient, he stayed right at the foot of the mountain waiting on the leader. With all that was happening in the camp, he was caught between two, wanting to see his leader, because an indefinite wait is a really long wait. If somebody says, okay, wait, I'll be back, maybe a week, I don't know, somewhere around there, but if a person says, soon come, and one week passes, and two weeks passes, a whole month passes. And they still haven't come. After a while, you probably will be tempted to go up there. But based upon the integrity and the faith factor of trust to the loyalty of leadership, I believe that the leader says he soon comes. No matter how long it takes for me to stay here, I'm going to hold this territory until he returns. Not only that, but there was purpose scarcity. There was keenness of insight. Because when Moses came down off the mountain with the tablet and said to Joshua, Hey, Josh, what's all that noise? That sounds like the noise of celebration. Joshua was so keen that Joshua said, That sounds like war. You know, the people who are, who are called to, to deliverance ministry will almost see everything in the demon. And see the demon in everything. Talk to me. The person who is called in the ministry of, of faith and healing will see everything as an opportunity to bring healing and deliverance. Spirit, soul, and body. So where you are inclined to serve, that will be the incentive and the, the impetus that you are driven by. Joshua was a warrior in training. And when Moses thought it was all celebration, Joshua realized that there was a terrifying demon in the camp and there was war between the values and the spiritual ideals of Israel and these Egyptian gods. Hallelujah, somebody. So you could see that he was already in training. By the time you got down to the book of Exodus, the 17th chapter, when the Bible said the children of Israel shined with Moses. They argued, that you brought us out here to kill us. Why didn't we just die? Wasn't there no graves left in Egypt that you brought us out here to kill us? And they were really giving Moses a hard time. And the Bible said Moses cried unto the Lord, not to them. Then Moses said, now you can imagine, there are those who want to identify with the exclusivity of being able to be a part of the untoward of leadership. People whose credibility is built because they can associate with the governmental status of the church. There's a congregational ministry and there's a governmental ministry. But they are both ministries. They're both ministries so that we don't have to seek for the affluence of aligning ourselves with the fivefold ministries so that we can gain respect from the body of Christ. Remember where God puts you and bloom there, excel there, and succeed there. Hallelujah, somebody. So by the time now, the Bible says that Amalek came out. Amalek means warlike in Exodus chapter 17. And Amalek comes out to make war. As long as you are in a place of servitude, expect a fight. But the Bible says Amalek gathered in Rephidim. And Rephidim means proven ground. Every ministry must be proven. You want to run the service. You have not sown no seed. I haven't seen your tithe. Where is your tithe? You want to hold an office and you haven't tied it? That's one of the first things God will say. Inadvertently, here's what's going to happen. Joshua, I'm going ahead of myself with this and I'm coming back. God is saying, Joshua, I have something in store for you. You're going to leave. But there are ten cities that you're going to conquer. But the first of the ten cities is mine. You're going to get a thousand dollars, but I want a hundred dollars off the top. And listen, because I have a thousand dollars for you, when you get the first hundred, there's nine hundred ahead by faith. But because sometimes we walk by sight, when the first hundred comes in, it's hard to let it go. Joshua had ten cities, but when he took the first Ai, come on, now when he took the first Josh Jericho, the key thing is that there was an Achan who saw, committed. That's the same spirit that robs God of the tithes and the offering, took it to themselves and hoard it. And when Joshua was there praying into God says, get up off your face. The problem is not going to be resolved by faith. There is physically somebody withholding the blessing from me. Robbing me of my tithes. Hey! Oh my God. The 
principle. You're not going to conquer IE. You're not going to get success unless you understand the principles of giving me the one and ten first. Then the nine cities are not yours. How far you could reach when you seeded your monies and your time, your talent, talent, and your treasure into the kingdom of God, that will take you beyond that of your highest hopes and dreams. Look at him as a neighbor. Are you tired?
confident to be to be so clear, not nebulous, vague, and so on, and so deep that you can understand. You must be challenged, yes, indeed, but you still must amen, have a grasp on what's being told so that you can take it and run with it. It may be going to tarry away upon it, it's surely going to come. But if the vision receiver is a vision caster and he casts or she casts the vision, you catch the vision and you cultivate the vision until it is realized. But where there is no vision, there is a deep vision. Because people begin to draw from their own ideals and their own identities, their own idiosyncrasies and their own walk philosophies and begin to suggest what God is saying. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So then, as long as Moses' hand was lifted up, Israel prevailed. But when his hand went down, I'm going to prevail. Everything that you are getting in your experience down in the congregational ministry is predicated on the support of the governmental ministry. If you can lift up the hands to a word of encouragement, how is your bills paid? Your car needs a new tire. Here, Pastor. All I can hear is a little oil. But not your hair, but your um needs a little oil.
Are you hearing me? Yeah. It was a blessing, but it's not enough for you to think it's a blessing and keep it to yourself. You've got to be willing to get the flowers where it's due. You've got to be willing to get credit where it's due. You've got to be willing to encourage each other with a word. Yeah. Building faith, building morale, building character. Building, are you hearing me? The kind of confidence that is necessary to get the victory won. He said, rehearse it. Keep telling it over to him and over to him again. Because what's happening here is that you're building in him the kind of formidable character that will rise up to stand against everything that's thrown his way. That's why the tenacity that you saw in Joshua. Imagine Joshua a little later on in his ministry. Joshua sees an angel with a drawn sword. Oh God, let me give you a few principles before we close. Amen, somebody. Amen. We said success is the result of making God's desire our desire. Success in the truest sense is directly related to God's perfect will for your life. That's true success. Am I where God wants me to be? Hello? Jeremiah, some 40 something years preaching. Ain't nobody say it. But was Jeremiah successful? Yes. Because Jeremiah was where God wanted him to be. And in terms of providence and timing and remnant theology, there's always some that will not bow. God if for his purpose in terms of his sovereign will, even if you do not see in your lifetime results of your labor, God is pleased, it's the will of God, and as long as you are in the will of God, you are successful. God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. Then he brought him to Haran, Haran means crossroads. We all reach a place, we must make a decision. From the crossroads of Elias, he took it to Shechem. Shechem means a ridge. You get to the place of time, faith tells you, look, uh, the enemy tells you you're gonna fall off. You just have to say, I, I'm leaning on the last arms. And you can't fall anywhere else with this guy's hand because you are where God wants you to be. From Shechem to Egypt means black land. Sometimes you will mess up, you will lie, talk to me, and you will tell it to get a feel as if there's no hope. But that doesn't mean you're not where God wants you to be. And even if the Egyptian kicks you out, come on, talk to me, somebody. You can find your girar, the place of a circle. And even though you feel you're going in circle, you're still in the will of God because you're looking for a city with foundations who will build the right maker with God. And because of pilgrim passing through, the fact that you're walking through this earth, the will of God, if I can help somebody as I travel along, then my living shall not be made. I'm successful. Can I reach my mom Mariah? Can I reach the peak that will challenge the ultimate challenge to my faith? Is can I give up Isaac? Look at him as a neighbor. Can you give up Isaac? Some of you Isaac's been so good to you. He been paying your rent, and, 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 and we ain't married, but you know he takes care of me. Some of you Isaac, talk to me. Uh -huh. She's a little friend that you call every now and then when you're lonely and things ain't right at home, and she can talk comfort because my wife just don't understand. You lying devil. I'm going after this devil. I'm going after this devil. You think that Lord, can you give up Isaac? God doesn't want what you don't want. God wants the thing that you're nursing. God ain't gonna come with a bulldozer because it's all I have, Lord. Take me as I am, everything. No, God doesn't want everything. God wants the thing. The thing. I'm talking about the thing which is really sexy. God wants the thing. So, so you're saying, God, bring me with a dump truck and take me all that I have on that. God come down. You think he's coming down with a dump truck? He's coming down with a tweezer. The thing. You know what I'm saying? It's the thing. Somebody with the attitude and tell it, it's the thing. That's what God's after. God's after the thing. Now, my mama might not know it, my husband and my wife might not know it, but God knows it. God wants the thing. And if you are going to reach your Moriah, where you're going to offer up the thing that is meaningful to you and that has worth and value to you, God is saying, offer it up to me and you will be justified and you will be successful. So, success. <laughs> well, here is the oxymoron, here is the twist. Because now we're going to say, success means I should be increasing. I should, uh uh, you might be diminished before you increase. But that doesn't mean you're not successful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do not determine your misfortune as some evident token that you're in this favor of God. Do not determine that if that was the case, then David was cursed. Hello, somebody. His son raped his daughter. His other son.
son killed Amnon just to get even with Timah. Then the son who did what the father should have done because the father was so slack, he was busy looking at the Bathshebas of this world, he forgot to take care of his house. So when, when, when Absalom rose up to take care of what the king should have taken care of and, and got rid of Amnon who raped Tamar, are you hearing me? And now David, rather than disciplining the little boy, David walks away from the house. Some father will say, I'm being by this house and I'm paying the mortgage and you, you can't live in this house and comply with the rules, here's the door. But instead David packs his things and David leaves. I'll show you how dangerous this was. When David fled from Absalom, the Bible said he was Abishai who cursed David. And when he cursed David, the men, uh, Joab said, should he fall upon the son of the lion? David said, no. Maybe the Lord had left him to curse me. Watch David's humility. But stupidity. David said, now, maybe the Lord had left him to curse me just so as to discipline me. But when they heard Absalom hung himself, because anybody who built with pride, you give them enough rope after a while. Go, hmm. And so, after a while, when he heard that Absalom the boy died, then he, he, he went, went back. On his way back, he said, here's Abishai. Please forgive me, because Abishai, when he was running, says, good, it serves you right. Many servants have run away from their masters lately. What you did to Saul, you're getting it in return. Uh, and, and he was jeering him. And, and, and the captain is, what you're made of is what you're made of. Don't mess with the folks who are always chasing demons. They are deliverance workers. They're called to intercede. They're warriors. It's not your call yet. Because we're all called to fight. And if you're not fighting, you're being fought. There's no passive middle ground. Hello? <laughs> Him and 
took your money, blew your mind, and broke your heart. That's it. Leave him in the hands of God. But I won't rest until I see him get it what he Come on. Because when he has when he has asked God forgiveness and he's in heaven, walking around shopping and jumping and rejoicing. And you in hell are saying, you And he, the culprit, is on, having received forgiveness, being justified. Listen, some folks that have hurt you, my God, you know it's why you're still walking around with the wounds and the hurts, memorizing and rehearsing all the negative things. You notice that they just got a better paying job with a brand new home and they're living in a bigger and they have a bigger car and their children are doing well. Why? Because they have moved on. Meanwhile, you are there nursing the failures of the past. Even what the Bible tells us, even that if you meditate on the law, if you think about the good promises of God, these things as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You are what you think. You ever notice when you there are some Asians when you when you go in some Asians that they they smell like their food. Come on, talk to me. It comes out to their pores. You can tell a man, a man who eats yam and dashi. You can tell a man who eats banana. Come on and dump it. You can tell a man. <laughs> I'm not talking about deodorant now and camouflage situation. I'm just talking about you can tell a man who is eating the food on the ground. <laughs> Chinese food, Chinese man, smell like Chinese food. <laughs> so Philippians 4 8 says, think on these things. Think on the things that make for edification. Things on, think on the things that, that build, the things that, that, that can affirm what you're hoping for. Then secondly, not only a right concept, but a reliable conduct. Here's the secret to success. The right concept, yes, you have the right ideas. It's not in idealistic terms because you've got folks that are real and you have folks that are ideal. Real folks, if they're really bad, just be really bad. Because if you're really bad, you're going to be trying to be really good. But there's nothing I dislike more than a phony. People who, they know me, I'm, I praise the Lord, nice to meet you. And when they turn around, I can't stand this anymore. Come on, talk to me someone. Don't look at the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. There are folks who know the jargon of the religious terms. They come in church and they know how to make their way to the mountain top. But praise the Lord, Pastor. God is good, isn't he? He's good all the time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hundred of a civic and hundred of a accord. And I, come on, talk to yourself. Yeah. They know exactly what to say. Hallelujah. But if you ever cut them loose among their friends, Lord have mercy, you wouldn't believe. Honey, you can tell the Bible, so you know them by their fruit. Anywhere that there's fellowship, after they finish, go back and see. If you find people hurting, people abused, people disillusioned, people cut down, people gossiped about, then you know sheep don't rip apart people. In church, you got three types. You got wolf, goat, and sheep. Lord have mercy. Can I fix it? You got wolf, bro. The wolf you can see coming. Because the wolf wants the high ground. The, the wolf wants the high ground. The wolf says, I'm looking for a man, I'm looking for a husband, I want my head man. Oh, I'm claiming him. The wolf wants the high ground. The wolf wants the perspective. The wolf wants to get a general idea of what's happening in the situation. But then you, but the problem is, it's not so much the wolf bishop because we could see the wolf. See the wolf. The wolf's objectives and motives, the wolf is giving the tie. I praise the Lord, I want to testify. I don't know that blessed me. And that's why I'm able to give a whole hundred pounds. A whole hundred dollars. But praise the Lord, may God be glorified. Amen. I'm going to bless my way right into my office. You can understand I'm a potential Bible resource for this church. I could help to make the vision realized. <laughs> Amen. But then when you got now, the problem is the goat, the goat against the sheep. Because the sheep loves peace. Yeah? The sheep just can't take contention. The sheep drinks from still waters. Just love a harmonious fellowship. Anything that pops up, then the sheep just believes the shepherd to just get rid of it. Just take the club and the staff and just protect me, please. But, but the goat, oh Lord have mercy. The goat can't stand still waters. The goat has to drink from moving waters. 
Then why do you think she liked you? When I was speaking to her, she said, um, um, when you were singing, the man who was sitting on behind, you know, Mr. John's cousin's uncle's brother's friend, he came and he said, she thinks she can sing, but you know, you have a voice. Who was it that said it? You know, the one in the purple shirt and the green tie. The goat likes to trouble the waters. And the only reason why sometimes, because, because of the power of God and his word in transforming the goat's nature into a sheep. That's why we leave the goat there. Some folks are a pastor, you only leave the goat there because you can milk it. But it's not true. We believe in the power of God's transforming word. Somebody put your hands together and give God some prayer. Do these things, Joshua, and you'll guarantee good success. Right concept. Have the right ideas, the right ideas. Meditate on God's word as the potential for growth and change. Yes. Secondly, have a reliable conduct. Yes. That your behavior lines up with your ideas, line up your walk, line up with your talk. It's not how high you jump, it's how you walk when your foot hits the ground. It's not in the clothes you wear, it's in the food you bear. So at the end of the day, it's not how you model. Look at him as a neighbor, keep it real. Even if you're really messed up, keep it real. Don't act like you are that when you're still messed up. Fess up, just fess up. Tell the truth, I'm a mess, God. Wash me, purge me, cleanse me. And as long as you're real, there is hope for your reality. But don't front it. Amen. Thirdly, there must be realistic concern. There must be realistic concern. And that means to show mercy and compassion every man to his brother, says Zechariah 7 9. Christ displayed compassion. And he was concerned about the deepest needs of mankind and humanity. If you're going to be successful, remember that you were a stranger in a strange land. When you get into your place of so called success, don't forget the strangers among you. Don't forget those. You were once a baby in Christ and you didn't know how to walk, how to talk, how to live. Stop criticizing that little girl. Begin to draw alongside her mother of the church and mentor her. Show her standards. Show her mother. Teach her how she should look and live and pray and dress and tear her to pieces. Be an example of the believer. Amen. Mother, we have many instructors but few fathers. Men be fathers indeed. Pull that young man to the side. He's looking for a male image. Looking for a man figure. I know his mama is doing a good job, but she can never do it like a man. Amen, so I'm sorry about that mom, but it's the truth. Amen, and so just draw alongside. Give that arm of support. Yes, it's a single home. You got your own family, but extend your family and embrace that young boy. Embrace that young man. You don't have to put him down, but he's looking for guidance, leadership, assurance. Are you hearing me? Teach him that the bulldog, tenacity of faith, will go against the grain of society. Because it's what you have on the inside that equips you to be able to fight the good fight of faith. If you're in the world, it is predominantly governed by those who are prejudiced and those who are biased. You have to be able to beat them at their game. In this country, they use their heads. If the Germans are known for perfection, they are known for intelligence. Therefore, if you're going to get credibility among them, rise above them, be their equal. You don't have to pick it, just be. You don't have to, you don't have to protest, just be. You don't have to do things that cuts against the grain because people taboo and mark you as a loser. You need to dare to be different. Let us rob a little convenience store down the street. What, what, what gives this officer the nerve to search me? Do you know who I am? Now by virtue of my appearance, he's going to disrespect or respect me. But if I am who I am, I will look like an ambassador. Second Corinthians chapter 5 tells us now then, you're ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador, here's a true title. Ambassador, extraordinary, and plenipotentiary. So when Paul told the church at Corinth that you are ambassadors, he just didn't use the entire title. But it means ambassador, extraordinary, and plenipotentiary. Now watch this. Can I take two minutes to do this? Ambassador, one who is the highest ranking representative of the state or the prince. Therefore, we are representing heaven as God's highest diplomat and representative of ambassadors here. But an ambassador has to be a diplomat. And we have to employ diplomacy to represent well because the country that you are in is not your own. So you can't just 
walk around when they have their laws that govern, these terrestrial laws of so-called civil government, that they see the black man with a certain kind of clothes, and they figure you must be driving, you must have drugs, and my windows are tinted and I'm looking sly, all like that. And it must be an but if I can thought myself as one who is truly wise, as a serpent, but harmless as a dove, and no church of the living God, that is godly wisdom going somewhere to happen. So an ambassador, the highest ranking representative sent from heaven or left here to represent God, he said, ambassador extraordinary, extraordinary. Means that when you look at the average Negro, hello, can I just go here for two minutes? I'm just trying to be nice about it. That there is a stereotype for average and that they almost warrant disrespect. Because you don't come to a wedding with a jeans pants on. But if you come properly attired, or because you want to touch the brain of society and you want to be different, what's different in today's world is to have self-respect and to step up with your affluence and to represent Christ well. I'm commanding respect by virtue of my very attire. I'm commanding respect by the virtue of my very demeanor. Much more when I open my mouth, I speak as one learning. I am your equal, Senator. I am your equal, Queen. I am your equal. Are you hearing me, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. President? And I don't have to fight for it, I just have to be. I'm not talking about, well, I'm the boss here. I'm the boss. If you are struggling talking about you're the boss, then maybe you are really in doubt whether you are the boss. If you are the boss, be the boss. If you're in charge, take charge. Ambassador, extraordinary. When everybody else is doing it, but now I do it. Extraordinary. But it's easy. It's a pushover that goes with the crowd. It's the sister that does it because everybody does it. It takes a real man to look at it as a girl you find. Lord have mercy. You blessed, fearfully and wonderful lady. What can I want it? I do not care for it. Here's an opportunity that I could get involved with this particular thing. And I have the power. I have, the, I have my own ability of choice. I can choose to do it. But I am making a conscious decision not to do it. Not because nobody will know when I'll be giving flowers and being patted on the back. But because of my own integrity, I've made an intelligent choice not to do it. That's what makes me a man. It's a boy. And when everybody's wearing it, I'm wearing it. It's a boy, and when everybody's walking it, I'm walking it. Come on, it's a boy, and when everybody's doing it, I'm doing it. The bottom line takes a man to stand up and say, no, you're all going that way. For Christ I live, for Christ I die. If I perish, I perish, but I shall not be moved. Like a tree planted by the rivers of water, I shall not be moved. God put this cause, came on into the kingdom to such a time as this. Meaning that 
ambassador or the representative or one who represents Christ here on earth has been delegated authority. But not just nominal power. It's plenus potent. Now, in colloquial terms, plenty is enough. Plenty is a whole heap. Plenty is a whole lot. Plenty is much. So, what God is saying is he has delegated plenty or much potency, power to us. Therefore, you have the ability to stand and withstand. You have the ability to conquer and not be conquered. You have the ability to succeed at whatever you put your hands to do. You don't have to take on the world's ideals in order to beat the world at this game. Heaven has invested supernatural power in us to master and conquer Earth's realm. You're an ambassador, you're full of power. You might not know it, but you're full of power. You might not feel it, but you're full of power. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you lose on earth, Joshua knew his power. Joshua said, I've got work to do, and these enemies are getting away. So I command you to stand still. Stay in the valley until I do kingdom business. That's power. Realistic concern for fully ready courage. You want to be successful? Ready courage. Draw from the supernatural abundance of supply. Ready courage. Joshua recognized that he was at the pace of his breakthrough. Right on the border of Canaan. But on that place of breakthrough lied an angel, a prophet of a supernatural power, a representation of God, the captain of the host, with a drawn sword. You see, you'll always have your finals. You can't just graduate without a final. You're not going to get into that hope of promise of greatness of success unless you have your final test. And if you don't pass a test in what we call the little quiz and little midterms, you're not going to get up to your finals. And the test is a test of loyalty, a test of faithfulness, a test of spirituality, a test of integrity, a test of character. That's what it is. And then there's a final that gives you the point of graduation. So here you find Joshua comes to the brink of Canaan and sees an angel with a drawn sword. And here's what Joshua says. Ready courage. Joshua walked, I'm talking about a towering supernatural. One angel wiped out some thousands into the Syrian camp. And here's an angel, a towering supernatural being, standing up like this with a drawn sword. A drawn sword means he's not going to sit and eat pickles. A drawn sword, he's not here, he meant to shine his shoes. This drawn sword means that this is a representation of war. How does Joshua approach him? You want to be successful? Joshua says, ready courage. Joshua walked up to him. Are you for us or are you against us? Do you think that if the angel said, um, I'm against you, you think Joshua would say, oh, I just wanted to know. <laughs> Joshua was ready to take on this magnificent structure, this warlike angel. The only thing was that God was speaking through the angel. The angel said, I'm not here to get into political things about which church I'm from and which congregation is important. I'm here as a representation of the throne of God and the warriors of God's host. I'm not here to discuss spiritual religious politics. This is not about politics and about correctness. I don't know about a religious correctness. So here's what you do. I'm here to tell you how to respond before you enter into promise worship before. Take off your shoes. And if you can shout now, you can shout then. Don't wait till the battle is over. Warrior, shout now. Is there a warrior in the house? Yeah. Just jump your feet. Just jump your feet for two minutes. And just give them a shout. Give them a shout. Give them a shout. Give them a shout. Don't wait till the battle is over. Shout now. Don't 
can't wait till you get into the place where you have the proof of your aspirations. Rejoice now. We share a concept with you. The Bible said that at the time when it was harvest, Gideon was threshing wheat by the wine press. There was no wind there. And primarily, this said something about his character that he had been so beaten down over the years by a defeat that he was in hiding. Because the Midianites would come and plunder their land. Year after year, they would devastate the land like locusts. They came up. Every time it was time to reap your harvest, and here comes Midianites with all their crocus bags and their empty slaves and, and, and in big boxes to gather what you worked hard for. And as usual, Joshua was so beaten down with servitude and defeat that he was hiding again. And while he's hiding, the angel of the Lord approached him and said, Hail thou mighty man of valor. The Lord is with you. He said, but if the Lord is with us, then why is all this happening? You see, that's not important to look at your now. It's to look at your then. God speaks to you in the affirmative, not about what you are now, but about what he has seen that you will be. And God will speak a word even this morning, even this day in your heart, to cause you to become all that he already says you are. So by the time you give you in a fleece, and listen, when God calls you and challenges you, he will let you go back and straighten out some things. Send him back or pull down the grooves of your father. There are some generation curses you've got to break before you can do any kind of ministry. Your daddy is worshiping a strange God. I curse that demon of alcohol. I curse that adulterous spirit. I curse and I denounce it from my family. My marriage will last. My children are blessed. I reject it. I retweet it. I shake it. Come in the name of Jesus. I'm reckoning with my past to deal with my religion. Meeting your needs, but not like Esau. Are you hearing me? Meeting your needs, but vigilant. 
and still looking around to make sure that they are not deceived, walking circumspectly, amen, examining themselves whether they are bearing the faith, the people who are still conscious of your walk with God, those, I want you to put them on the side, and the others who become so indulgent in, well, I want the money and I'll serve God later, but you know, I have to get the education, I have to get me the house, after I get married, then you know, I will sing on the choir, and lapping up all that stuff, put them on the side. We separated the men from the boys, and at the end of the day, we had 300, 300, Against 125,000, what are the odds? 450 to 1. And God said, no, you're ready. God said, go on now, go fight. But you know, God knows exactly where we are. And even when we're scared, God knows how to send us a witness to give us courage. God said, God saw you. God looked beyond his feelings. God looked beyond his now. And God said, I know that you have not arrived and realized what I have said, that you're a mighty man of valor. But if you're afraid, take Fura with you and go down among the camp. And Fura means light bearer. You still need folks that have illumination, revelation, inspiration. You need folks that are spiritual. You can't line up with carnal folks and expect to be successful. You need people that challenge your very standards, that challenge your, your own ideas, that challenges your morality. You need people that challenge you. He says, take Fura with you, the light bearer. And when they got down by the enemy's camp, right down by the waters, they were close enough, 135,000 troops. And this scared, nervous little fellow got close enough to hear a man expounding a dream. You know something strange? I had a strange dream last night. I mean, that's close. Because he's not shouting, he's talking. But by the bulrushes and by the bushes, we can hide. Close by the brook, and they all came down to drink. But a man, God will providentially put you right in the place at the right time. I don't believe you came here today by accident. I believe that God brought you in here today at this time to hear this word. I believe that where God put you to work, put you to school, put you in that place. It might be adverse, but providentially, it's just where God wants you to be. There's something he wants to say to you. And he heard a man expound the dream. I had a dream that a barley loaf cake rolled down off the mountain and hit the tent of the Midianites and smashed it to, to pieces. And the other man says, this is nothing more than the sword of Gideon and of the Lord. While God is working in your life, he's working in your enemy's life. While God is building your courage, he's sending them dreams and visions to make them scared of you. While God is telling you, woke up in you don't have, you don't have the qualification. But you want the job. Why well, God is working on you filling out the application? But I didn't do the GCEO levels. Why well, God is working in the supervisor's heart? A man is coming in, a woman is coming in today. And that's the person you ought to hire. That's the person you're going to promote. That's the person that's going to build this company. Are you hearing me? Why well, God is working on your heart? Building faith. Say, I'm going to apply for the job anyway. Because I want to do what God wants me to do. God is working in the house on the other side of the camp. Why well, God is building your faith? Your hopes and your dreams 
Your high spiritual success is predicated on your faith in God and your obedience to what He has said. If you, if you, if you hearken, if you are diligent to observe what God has said in His Word, and you begin to apply God's Word, you'll be guaranteed good success. There will be nothing too hard for you. You can beat the odds. I said you can beat the odds. You are really successful, you just haven't realized it. You might have experienced some degree of success, but you're still more ahead. Hallelujah, somebody. You must have ready courage. Big, big, royal conquest. Go forward. This is the victory to overcome the world, even your faith. How do you become that overcome? Trust and believe God. Prevail in prayer. So one, right concept. Two, reliable conduct. Three, realistic concern. Four, ready courage. Five, royal conquest. Six, prevailing prayer. Amen. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man, says James 5.16, avails much prevailing prayer. Everything you do, let prayer be natural. Natural means like you just took five breaths since my last statement and you did not even know it. It was so natural. Let prayer become a natural part of your very existence. Pursue the promise whereby are given to you exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of his divine nature. Second Peter 1 and 4. And then finally we have two more. Persist in patience. Persist in patience. Don't give up. The man who created the light bulb he started off over some 10,000 light bulbs before one lit up. If at first you don't succeed, try and try and try and try and try again. Persistent patience. Let patience have a perfect work that you might be perfect and entire wanting nothing. And the trial of your faith, though it be precious, let's try like as of gold. Let it find strength and persevere because it's founded on Christ. The scripture says you have need of patience. And after you have done the will of God, you should receive the promise. Amen. Proclaim his praise. Proclaim his praise. Begin to affirm what God has done, what God has said, who God is, what God will do. And then, of course, you publicize his purpose. Objectively, let us begin to herald the good news. To begin to go forward with the Great Commission as his return is at hand. I challenge you today. Can you apply these principles of success? I challenge you today. Is there enough faith in you to mix it with these ingredients and begin to live this overcoming victorious Christian life? It's come that we might have life and that we might have more abundant day. I challenge you today. This book of the law should not be part of your mouth, but you should meditate in it day and night, for therein you shall be making your way prosperous, prosperous, and you will guarantee good success. God bless you.